Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be together again. Uh, I do hope you're well. I uh, do really pray that you'd stay safe, uh, that you'd uh, restrict your movements as much as possible uh, and, um, and really, really uh, put your trust in the Lord in this time. Uh, let me just open up in a word of prayer before we launch into Daniel chapter 7, uh, the first of four visions. And today's sermon title is called Don't Be Afraid of a Four-Headed Leopard with Wings. And uh, I'll explain that a little bit later. But uh, let me quickly pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak to us, Lord, and that you, God, are a God who saves. We want to give you thanks and praise today that you want to comfort us and strengthen us. Uh, as you did Daniel and, of course, uh, Israel in the time of exile and in the time of persecution. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would give us soft hearts and, um, I guess, sharp minds. Please, Father, we pray, um, help us be responsive to your word for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> um, yeah, many people prefer movies to books and are more visually impacted by images. Uh, you'd probably know as children's books are often picture books with the story being told uh, visually rather than audibly. Well, welcome to Daniel chapter 7 uh, and 7 to 12, really. A world of wild and wonderful apocalyptic pictures. Now, <clears throat> apocalypse is best understood as revelation, uh, which is the title of the last book of the Bible, and again uses imagery and pictures to convey the deep spiritual truths of the writer. So the big question for us today is how can wonderful and wild visions help us to live in the world today where we have uh, escalating conflict in the South China Sea, where we have, of course, um, genocide and uh, civil war in uh, many countries and Myanmar with such persecution against the Rohingya people, flash floods in Europe and India, a raging pandemic, uh, with many facing sickness and a death toll that continues to rise. And least to say, uh, facing continual financial hardships and perhaps even having to cope with an ever-present sense of anxiety or deep depression. I guess just for many of us being locked down for five weeks plus or maybe longer is uh, beginning to bear signs of fatigue. Um, but we must understand that we are not the first people who have wondered about the future and how it's going to turn out. You see, understanding apocalyptic writing in Daniel will help sustain us and help us live through these uncertain times and uncertain times in the future. Hardships, trials and tests. These writings are designed uh, to help us live a in a victorious faith and remain faithful to God when the pressure's on. When the world seems like it's chaotic, we can see and we can know that God is in control. And what's more, I believe that apocalyptic writing reveals the greater plans that God has for us, greater plans that we could ever dream or imagine. Um, they also show us that God rules and every government and kingdom derives its authority from God. Daniel is particularly important to understand because it deals with the ultimate destiny of the world. And I think there's many out there, I, I hope and pray, 
that people who don't go to church, who aren't Christians, uh, switch the channel on here. Have a look at Daniel as it provides details and deals with the ultimate destiny of the world. Uh, Many of the commentators say Daniel chapter 7 to 12 is no longer focusing on the present exile but is making satirical commentary on the political and theological situation in Jerusalem in the second century. This was the time when the Seleucid rulers who were offshoots after Alexander the Great, who was that ruthless Greek ruler who had swept through the Middle East and got as far as India. And this is where uh, Antiochus Epiphanes appeared, stepped in and came to power and severely persecuted the Jews. Um, I think it's in 168 BC, he made the, the Jewish leaders sacrifice to the idols and occasionally killed them, of course, to keep the rest in line. He desecrated the temple and, of course, uh, really, I guess, made a mockery of the Jewish religion. Uh, those Jews fought hard to keep their laws and their religious rituals in place, but he was particularly, uh, yeah, particularly nasty and cruel to many of the Jews. Uh, but getting back to Daniel chapter 7, we see that Daniel is no longer the interpreter of the dreams he is the now. He is now. Sorry, the one who would receive the vision and receive this insight. Pick it up with me, Daniel chapter seven, verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Now, the other thing that sticks out, of course, in the opening verse is that we've travelled back in time, back to the first year of Belshazzar's reign as king. Um, In verses 2 to 8, we're not going to read them. You can read them for yourself. And please, read the book of Daniel. It's a cracking read. Uh, We have Daniel's first vision and one which has four great beasts coming out of the sea, which in Jewish thought the sea represented chaos. And in verse 15 to 18, we actually have the explanation. So here we go. Uh, Chapter 7, verse 15 to 18. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Now, isn't that comfort to know? Isn't that really reassuring? Um, But, of course, the speculation is endless uh, of who these four kings are. You know, it's been Persia, Greece, the Romans, even Hitler, or America, and some have even cited the EU as one of those kingdoms because of, at one stage, they had ten countries that were part of the EU. But, uh, you know, the Europeans wrecked that by adding more countries, so that theory uh, was ruined. And you can understand why people want to try and work out the historical reference of who and what these kingdoms are. Uh, and I guess it's in the hope that that is the last, the final uh, um kingdom that would rise up and persecute or or annihilate and crush people. Because, as we know, these kingdoms crush empires, ravenous, monstrous kingdoms that really 
crush people underfoot. And I want to say that there's nothing nice about these beasts. Some of the imagery is descriptive of hybrid creatures with leopards having wings and four heads and lions having wings and feathers. They both represent the disorder and the chaos of these kingdoms. You've got to remember that these images are apocalyptic and and they are to convey truths. They are not literal. So if you weren't or if you were an alert Jew, you would understand, sorry, what this symbolism meant. You get the point that your religion and temple are being overrun by these bloodthirsty pagan rulers. You know, that's what the message is conveying to Daniel. And, of course, this message, instead of the last ones, which were pointed to the world to see the glory and the power of God in his ultimate reign and rule. But these visions are given to the people of God to strengthen them in times of trial and persecution. This fourth beast is even more fierce and has no familiar form at all. It has iron teeth and ten horns, which are symbols of great power. And ten, of course, shows that this kingdom or king has great strength. But as we can see, they're not positive. It's no it's, it's not positive, only destructive in nature and form. A theme that runs through the book of Daniel is that all power is given by God, even if it is not good or used for good and, of course, often misused. I think we have the same reality today, don't we, where all governments are not entirely good. But, of course, some are better than others. And, to be honest, none are good compared to God's plans and promises and his eternal rule as king and God of the universe. Uh, The vision shows that among those ten horns appeared another smaller horn. Let's pick it up in verse 8, chapter 7. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, please don't get caught up in trying to figure out where the eyes were on the horn. This is simply apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, sorry, imagery. And many commentators recognise this image as human and that of Antiochus Epiphanes, a boastful mouth who rails and rallies against God and his people. The arrogant, taunting boasts of the human kingdom is abruptly interrupted by another vision that caught Daniel's eye. Let's pick it up, verse 9 and 10. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. The imagery is great, isn't it? We see the Ancient of Days takes his seat and it's not for pomp or ceremony. Daniel's vision brings us into the very courtroom of heaven where verdicts and judgments are handed down. We've got to remember that these beasts have been warring against the Ancient of Days. So on one side we have the history of human kingdoms with its vileness and its power struggles. 
And on the other, we have a vision of heaven, a vision of the Ancient of Days who stands and is seated as the judge of all. The images of the Ancient of Day, Days pardon me, are meant to comfort and reassure the people of God that God is in control. And it's the great one that rules and not the others. The whiteness of his clothing and hair are symbols of purity, enduring wisdom and authority that stands unchallenged. The fire, of course, is referring back to the burning bush and the great I am who is simply unapproachable and holy as we remember that encounter of Moses. The flaming throne, the river of fire, the source of power and authority that flows from his rule. Fiery wheels and those rivers and all those imagery bring a familiarity with it and remind God's people of other visions and, again, bring comfort because this vision is showing that this is our God, a God we know and are familiar with, a God who has ruled and reigned, a God who is all-powerful and the great I am. Countless heavenly hosts attend him and there's countless others who worship. Although beasts have uh, armies, They are nothing compared to the multitude of the heavenly hosts. And these images are to remind God's peoples people, sorry, of the ultimate victory that God will uh, bring. But more than that, these images are not just showing us. God's power and authority, but the gracious justice of heaven as the books are being opened on humanity. What a comfort this would be for God's people who found no justice on earth and no mercy or justice from human rulers. Justice would come for the people of God if they will persevere. And the message is that no kingdom or ruler can challenge God without his judgment coming swiftly. Let's read verse 11 and 12, chapter 7. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. Here we see the boastful human is slain and the other kingdoms, although stripped of power, are allowed to exist and be recognised throughout history. And the point is that Daniel must realise that God's ultimate victory over evil will take longer than the 70 years of exile. It will be a long time coming. But justice and, of course, God's ultimate victory over evil will come. Whilst Daniel was gazing at the vision of the slain boastful antagonist, who had rallied against God. We see another figure, but this one is not a beastly figure. No, this one is human in appearance. Verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And immediately we go, ding, 
Jesus. We go straight to Jesus, don't we? But that might not have been Daniel's first thought, and it might not have been the thought of many Jews because they didn't have any clear reference like we do of Jesus. We would probably be likely to see the reference to an everlasting dominion as being that great promise that God gave to David in 2 Samuel 7, 14, where a king would come and rule forever on his throne. But many Jews of the time wouldn't have made that connection. Let's read again verses 13 and let's read 14 as well. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The reference to one like a son of man would have probably been seen as an image of God's deliverance and ultimate victory in a corporate sense uh, as the readers would have possibly seen the coming kingdom and its embodiment as the people of God, Israel. Of course, this vision would have helped keep them going. But to the Jew, this would have been a picture of God sweeping away all other kingdoms. And, of course, false empires but they would still have to wait for Messiah in hope, although their wait would be longer than what they would first hope. You know, it's important to grasp that, that they mightn't have jumped straight to Jesus and they were more in their thinking of that corporate victory, perhaps even a a military leader as we heard uh, in the Gospels. This picture, of course, of um, Messiah and the final victory of God is going to be built up over the following chapters and climax in the final chapter, chapter 12, with the clearest picture of the end of this age and the resurrection of all people. Let's just flip over the page to chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is a great vision. This is a vision of the end, that final resurrection where all are judged. This would have brought such comfort for those living under corrupt rulers and facing, you know, circumstances that they're powerless in. They would know that this life is not the end. For us, think about the Son of Man, Jesus. For we, you know, we know just what God has done. And when we do that, we realise that God has done so much or gone so much further than the Jew ever dreamed God would. Jesus wouldn't lead a revolution or an army of soldiers, but instead would be given a kingdom with innumerous worshippers and a kingdom that would never end. 
death in this life was not the end for his followers. And Jesus in the Gospels opens up a greater need than military safety or monetary prosperity. The term the Son of Man was used by Jesus to identify himself with that great messianic promise, even if Daniel and his countrymen might not have seen it at the time. We are privileged. We have that privilege to see the vision of Daniel unfolding in the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, Jesus painted a vision that includes the most vulnerable and powerless people on the planet. I want you to go fast forward now into Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 13 to 15. You'd be familiar with this. Then people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. You know, this is one of the most beautiful pictures of the Lord Jesus and gives us a picture of his idea of who the kingdom people will be. His idea of a kingdom, a kingdom that is made up of those who aren't obsessed with power or wealth, but who have the marks of joy, innocence and peace. A kingdom where social status is not honoured and where even children are safe, valued and loved. A kingdom for people just like you and me. And the chapter in Matthew ends with Jesus sitting on his glorious throne as the Son of Man, as he calls himself. Let's pick it up in verse 28 and 30. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. We see that the ways of this world are inverted and that the first will be last and the last will be first. And, of course, you'd be familiar with the story that lies in between these two brackets, the story of the rich young ruler, which warns us not to let anything get between you and your heavenly father, not even wealth or power. And Jesus gives that wonderful promise to those who have followed him and given up everything and anything to be one of his disciples, even leaving family or businesses. And the promise is that they'll be rewarded with much more and eternal life. And the point is that Jesus identifies our greatest need, which is to find our place in the kingdom. You know, you might be content to live under a government or a regime or in a world that provides wealth, safety and pleasure in spades. But Jesus invites us to be part of a kingdom where the king or ruler is one like us, but human and divine, where he is a friend of the downcast and the friend of the sinner, a great ruler, but one who eats with the poor 
and the brokenhearted. One who argues the truth and argues for justice with the self-righteous religious leader who still doesn't get what God's kingdom is all about and doesn't understand the type of king and ruler who sits on the throne. Jesus, the Son of Man, would express his love for all of us by hanging on the cross so that we might be freed from sin and death and become part of his eternal kingdom. And through his great sacrifice, he brings an end to human kingdoms and those ravenous rulers will eventually be completely removed and defeated. I hope you see this morning that Jesus identifies our greatest need. You know, I saw marches yesterday, marches that were intended to bring freedom. But to be honest, they are just born out of fear, fear and a lack of understanding that there is a greater need than our prosperity, than our our well-being just at the moment, even though I don't know how that's going to bring that about. I think it'll only harm it. But Jesus identifies our greatest need to be part of the kingdom, a kingdom that will last forever, a kingdom that will be given to us and will never be taken away. And like Daniel and the second century Jewish people, we wait patiently for all things to be renewed. And whatever we face now will not have the last say And this life is not the end because we have a greater hope knowing that Jesus has come, and that's what Daniel is telling us, Jesus has come and will return again. If you've listened this morning, I hope you, you would take up that invitation that Jesus offers to be part of his kingdom that you would place your trust in him so that he might give you eternal life and much more right now. Hope, comfort and security knowing that this life is not the end, but there's one to come. There is eternal life, a glorious life with Jesus and our Heavenly Father. If you've prayed that prayer, if you pray a prayer today, sorry, and ask Jesus into your heart, I want you to know that you have that comfort. You have that reassurance that he has forgiven your sins on the cross. He has taken away that sin and freed you. And you don't have to fear what the government, what the the world throws at you. But you can rest and trust in Jesus who tells you that this life is not the end. God bless. Uh, As I said before, have a great week. Stay safe. And... um, Restrict your movement as much as possible. I want to uh, just finish by giving uh, our benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.